Welcome to the Andy Staples Show. Very special guest today, a guy who has entered my regular podcast rotation uh, with a show that, that started two or three weeks ago, uh, the Gojo Show. Mike Golick Jr., welcome. Appreciate you having me, man, and uh, appreciate you letting me into your ears. That sounds really weird to say. I'm upset Dude. with myself for saying it, but it's out there now. We can't take it back. A little awkward, yeah. But no, it's it it, it is a great show. Uh, for those who don't know, you left ESPN a few months ago uh, to to strike out on your own. You've got a, a new show that is daily everywhere you get podcasts. You and, and former Notre Dame teammate Brandon Newman, and it's. It's great. It's it's the entire sports world in about an hour 20, and you guys are hysterical. I, we were talking before the show. So Mike and Brandon obviously know each other very well. Brandon played his last year at Ball State, and they played UCF in the Beefo Brady's Bowl after that season. And Brandon was talking about, uh, I believe it was Desmond Howard going in on him in the broadcast. Yes. <laughs> but, but then Brandon breaks down really what the social life is like at a, uh, at a Beefo Brady's type bowl. And it was, it was just glorious. It, it's, you know what, what we want to provide, like you said, we're like the cliff notes for your sports day, heading into your morning, try and give everyone that background, but also, yeah, maybe pull back the curtain a little bit on some things that we managed to experience. And boy, oh boy, what a weird niche Brandon and I have covered of lower tier collegiate bowl games and how drinking your way through bowl practice can certainly be one way to go about business when you're getting ready to compete in various esteemed games like the Champ Sports Bowl and the Sun Bowl in El Paso. Uh, I think I covered that Champ Sports Bowl you were in. That was uh, Florida State. So. That was Florida State. That was Florida State. And uh, that was uh, us gacking away a fourth, uh, 14 point lead in the fourth quarter to EJ Manuel, who I ended up being a co worker with at ESPN through the ACC network. So funny to. Funny they were to also see starting EJ a 16 year old at tackle at, at one of the tackle spots in that game. <laughs> So. They were starting a 16-year-old at tackle. Timmy Jernigan, thankfully, was a freshman defensive tackle yes. and not at the height of his powers, so he didn't whoop my ass in that game. But, uh, yeah, they had some dudes on that team and a 16-year-old playing tackle. And, and it was great to hear him explain why he thinks the cloud is Skynet and, and will become self-aware and the machines will take over. But you guys got into a great conversation because it was right after – this is the, the, the day of the Jimbo – press conference you recorded that night and it was it was fantastic because here are two guys who, who played major college football who worked inside the machine at ESPN who called games and both of your attitudes were like this is great this is making me so excited for the games <laughs> it, I mean hell this is college football like in general, the sport is like one or two standard deviation points away from full-blown WWE. That's, I think, a part of the sport that we should embrace. I mean, my last call on the Duke's Mayo Bowl was kind of an ode to that in that yes. we're allowed to treat the absurdities of this sport, the weird sponsorships, the way that head coaches especially become these major characters because they are the ones that endure while these players have four and five year windows of eligibility. And so, yeah, ultimately for the reason I could sit there and go, yeah, this is awesome. And it makes me excited for SEC media day for the actual game on October 8th is because ultimately I think it's going to be fruitless in what one of the perceived goals might've been, which is to actually get anything done about regulating name image and <laughs> right. likeness. Cause no one's going to be able to do that. Even if Nick Saban truly has a problem with the system, even if Jimbo truly feels like nothing's going on. The thing with me is, all right, I don't think it's going to affect the bottom line of these players in any immediate way. So I'm allowing myself to laugh at these two grown men having a public pissing contest. It's, it, it is spectacular. And it just keeps giving to us because I, I think Jimbo recorded the interview with the TV station on Friday. They ran part of it Sunday. They will run another part of it next Sunday, which I'm assuming is the bad part yeah. or the, the boring part. I think it's about how he's going to plug holes on off on his offensive line. But I, I just like at a certain point, I'm just like, wow, you're still talking this for those who have not seen the K KSAT interview. Here's a here's a little nugget. I went and checked with our compliance people because we have nothing to do with it. One guy of the 11. Yes. Of the early enrollees. Of the early enrollees. Gotcha. So that said, what is all this dust up about then? Great point. 
I, I, I've just got to ask you, were you shocked that this came up? Because you just told I, me you I only said, had one. I said that about I said that about a while ago. It's like that's why I made the original one back in February when they said we had $35 million in the thing. That's that's it's all false. It's all it's all it was written on social media, so everybody believes it. And you got news channels believing it. Hey, big people believing it. And you believed it. Well, and Nick Saban believed it, obviously. Well, he's not news. You're news. You're media. Do you guys not research? <laughs> he's not news. You're news. <laughs> was that reverse gotcha journalism by Jimbo? It, it, was, it was amazing. There's another point where he goes, you're out of questions. I got you rattled. <laughs> he was so proud of himself in that moment for shifting it away from Nick Saban and making it fully about the media. And listen, I get it. Should so many people have run with something tweeted by sliced bread? But no, the college football internet is a strange and wild place. I mean, we do also have a sports internet that is routinely duped by an account, uh, account called, I mean, I don't know if I can ball say sack it. Sports. Ball sack sports. Yeah, yeah. Like, we get, like, we get people who dupe by ball sack sports all the time. Jimbo is right in that the media engine does not always hum the way it should, but it doesn't change what this is about. It's core just because you found one guy you get to sit face to face with who, yeah, might have thought that because, oh my God, college football invites us all the time to believe that stuff like that might be true. Like it doesn't yes. sound far fetched in the college football world that we know. There's no spoke track for college football. Like we can't call up the NIL deal. Where, where are they under the cap? We, we yeah. can't figure that out. <laughs> So, but this, this, the, the Jimbo keeping talking to as much as I want him to, and as much as I feel like this is such a beautiful gift to all of us who, who do shows and write stories and whatnot, a, a listener named Mike Connolly, this is not Michael Connolly who wrote all the lawyer books, fellow, fellow University of Florida journalism school grad, Michael Connolly, by the way, get watch the Lincoln lawyer on, uh, I think it's Netflix, uh, but the, not that, not that Mike Connolly, uh, he says, you keep calling Jimbo's press conference, the best press conference ever. You seem to have forgotten about the butt chugging press conference. Nothing will top that. And I brought this up to you before the show, and you mentioned that you did not remember it. And so we're going to introduce you and some of the listeners to the butt chugging press conference, which let me, uh, we'll, we'll set the scene here. It's 2012, University of Tennessee. Uh, a, a member of a fraternity is admitted to the hospital with a blood alcohol level of 0. 0.40. Hmm. Apparently, some boxed wine has been consumed. Quite a bit of boxed wine has been consumed. He is. This is obviously a serious, life-threatening situation. One of the other people involved in this drinking escapade mentions to, I don't know if it's the cops or to the medical staff, that these people had been butt-chugging. What is butt-chugging, you ask? It's an alcohol enema. I... I don't know the physiology of it, but I'm guessing uh, there are porous surfaces inside the body that can absorb alcohol, I guess, as well as if you or or better drink it. Or yeah, better. yeah, that's and true. I believe faster. Yes, yes, and and I mean, I, there's eyeball stuff too. We won't even get into that, but but so this apparently was something that this this Tennessee student told officials was going on. And once this guy recovered, and I'm, I'm glad he did, we he wanted to make sure the world knew that he was not butt chugging. So he hired a lawyer who's a cross between Ben Matlock and Foghorn Leghorn. And this lawyer put on his best bow tie and held a press conference. And now if you wanted to downplay the importance of the phrase butt chugging, you would probably say alcohol enema Use that phrase, which is a lot tamer, does not titillate quite as much. You wouldn't keep saying the phrase. Oh, no. But chugging. Right here is the president, was the president of Pi Kappa Alpha on this campus. When Mr. Bach went into his hospital room at the University of Tennessee Medical Center, he asked Xander if he had been butt chugging and xander's comment was what in the world is that what in the world indeed <laughs> by the way if you're just listening and you've never seen this press conference i invite you to to google it when you get to a place safely if you're driving you wait till you get there but google butt chugging press conference on youtube 
you have the entire fraternity yes. in suits. Everyone's wearing sunglasses. Yes. Most are posing like Secret Service agents. And the lawyer is not done saying butt chugging. I appeared about 30 minutes later, along with the chapter advisor of Pi Kappa Alpha, and I informed him that the reason that I was there was to ask him whether or not he had been involved in an activity called butt chugging. And he looked at me like I'd lost my mind and said, what is that? It's like he knows <laughs> he can bill more hours the more times he says it. I, again, the video is worth everyone's time because, as you mentioned, you have all of these khaki plaid wannabe Secret Service frat boys who also, I'm amazed, none of them break as he continues to no. say butt chugging. There's not a single smirk. No one moves because I can understand the person who has just recovered from all this, maybe not thinking butt chugging is the funniest thing in the world, but somewhere in the, yes. co the course of this fraternity, I figured someone would break character and not a single guy budge. That they is are, remarkable They are mean dedication. mugging. This is straight up high school football team yes. photo day. This like is you your rival's picture. Yeah, this you, is the you, picture you, you get grab, to look You're grabbing your rivals. shoulder pads and pulling them down. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's oh. exactly what this is. Wow. But he, he's not done. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the first time that he had ever heard of the two words, butt chugging, which have now become two famous words across the United States and across the world. See, across the world, Foghorn Leghorn Esquire knows he's going viral now. Yes. And he says, and he says the phrase so eloquent, butt chugging. It's amazing. But wait, he's not. Done. Mr. Uh, Broughton, Broughton, and it's, it is Broughton, not Broughton. It's Broughton, Scotch. Uh, denies each and every allegation whatsoever that has been inferred that he may be a gay man. He is a straight man, and he thinks that the idea and the concept of butt chugging is absolutely repulsive. And he thinks the idea of this press conference was a terrible one. Oh, I at wonder. That point. I wonder. Yeah, I wonder what the point was in all of this where the kid decided, wow, have I made a mistake? Because you said, what, this is like 2012 ish? This is 2012, yeah. So, so this is early internet. Like we're just starting to get things really going viral and that meaning something and that sort of being the currency that we operate in. So this had to be on the cutting edge. This, well, I mean, so we're eight years past the, the dawn of YouTube, but we have Facebook, we have Twitter. It can fly fast yes. at this point. And, and this is one of the first times it can fly. And it did. Oh, it did. He actually, the lawyer says, butt chug, I believe three or four more times in, wow. in the press conference, but I didn't want to belabor the point. It's just, I <laughs> thank you for showing restraint there. <laughs> <laughs> I, but it, it's, it's funny because I was watching Jimbo Fisher again after that listener pointed that out. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. This is like, it, it, it's almost like, okay, Jimbo, stop saying your version of butt chugging here. <laughs> well, you know what? First off, and I, I feel like I have to do this for Holly Anderson, uh, go Vols. Yes. It feels yes. like a big go Vols moment. Yes, but my friend Holly. Uh, proud Tennessee graduate. Yes, I I'm sure, especially in moments like this. But I do have to say, now what we need is we need sliced bread to come back and accuse Jimbo Fisher of butt chugging. Well, so we kind of had something that would be that's like internet inception right there. That's okay. that's that's Just extremely it out there. extremely online inception. The, the, the e EOI. Yes, is and e to be clear. I'm not saying that he did that or would do that. And I'm certain, but like, I'm just saying if this were to snowball into what it could be, that's the next logical step. As like you said, Jimbo keeps talking about this. 
it's going to invite more people to troll the situation. That's part of why Jimbo needs to stop is because this can be, wow, great battle between you and your old boss. If you keep talking, it's going to, it's going to get weird soon. It's going to get yeah. weird soon. So bro Bible, the, the site that aggregated sliced bread originally went in on Jimbo again, like Jimbo is going to burn bro Bible down. Uh, they aggregated another thing. There's a, a player who is committed to Texas or signed with Texas A&M. Uh, he's from Philly. There's a, there's a, a Pennsylvania, Maryland all-star game that they play in the summer. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if, if, if you guys did this back home, Florida and Georgia used to play one like June 1st, but they, they stopped doing that years ago because obviously they're all blue chip prospects and none of their college coaches were cool with them playing a football game in June. So this kid says he's not going to play and it's inferred that it's because he'll lose his NIL money. And a and he's not on campus yet. So a and has said he doesn't have a deal. Like the kids aren't on campus, don't have, de don't have deals. And so it's like, gotcha again. And it's bro Bible again. Oh my God. Yeah. It's, and, and that's the other part is hearing Jimbo because, you know, he talks like a, you know, Southern auctioneer. It's very yeah, yeah. perfect impression. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so hearing him have to say things like bro Bible and slice bread also super entertaining like this is the equivalent of putting the internet putting the cloud in the front of my dad and asking him to process this like him and Jimbo are probably close to closer to the same age and so all this stuff feels so foreign there uh, it's I, I don't know man it's it's wild and I, I guess the thing that I always go back to in all of this is I, I really wonder how long we're going to continue to feign to be upset that a school if I'm a coach that a school right. that I am working for has the ability to go out and do these things that are legal because I, I I sort of I think understand where this is coming from because we know how prideful he is about recruiting the fact that this is him versus Nick Saban which has that you know uh, student teacher however you want to phrase the rivalry that's clearly got some real tension to it but Jimbo, like a lot of other coaches, is so prideful in the notion that we're out here recruiting our asses off. My right. coaches are working really hard. I'm going to make sure everyone knows about it. We don't have to entice them with a damn thing. We're out here doing our jobs, which, like, your jobs have always included in some way, shape, or form using the massive funds and massive dollars coming into your school to sell the kids. It's just more direct now. Well, it, it, I think it's generational. So I, I think definitely the generation older than me – yeah. And I'm 43. That generation wants to pretend that nobody pays anybody or any payments under the table and that and, and wants to believe that giving someone money for being good at football is morally wrong, which is, again, on its face, incredibly stupid if you think about it for more than three seconds. But they want to believe that. Now, I think part of my generation wants to believe that. But I think you get much younger than that. And it's like, ah, who cares? Yeah, well, and I think it's also just the way they've been wired for so long. Like you have, like it's also shocking how brazen Jimbo was, how brazen Nick Saban was in talking about what was going on here. We've heard yeah. Lane Kiffin do it. We heard Deion Sanders because he was brought into this at Jackson State say, "Listen, I, I kind of know where the bodies are buried in all this. I've been doing this and around these high school players making that jump to college. Everyone's talking a lot more openly about it, and it's kind of like you know." You can use when marijuana was legalized. You can use when we finally were, you know, able to go back outside post pandemic and the masks started coming off. Is yep. for a while it you felt very hesitant because you had been so conditioned to doing one thing one way for so long. And for them, even if there was impropriety, you didn't talk about it outside because there was a thought that the NCAA actually would come knocking on your door and you didn't want to make more trouble than it was worth. So there's part of me that does wonder if this is just how they've been trained for so long to think about this and talk about this publicly that they're going to make sure, even if it's going on behind closed doors, no one with any sort of power to punish has anything to go off of because of them. Right. And well, and then you've got Nick Saban. See, I, Nick Saban broke the code mm -hmm. by naming, he didn't name Jimbo Fisher, but he essentially did. And he essentially named Deion Sanders. He broke the Omerta. It wasn't Jimbo that did that. Once, but I, I think Nick was surprised because we we always give Nick Saban, and, and I'm very guilty of this, 
that I, I assume that he has it gamed out all the way. Whatever he does, he has gamed it out, and he knows what's what, what the end point is. I don't think he realized that his breaking of the code would cause Jimbo to break it even more because I think Nick assumes everybody's afraid of him. Jimbo's not. And so Jimbo's like, well, you broke the code. The, the rules are off now. It is, and I, I understand that you're right. I think I think Nick understood how this was going to go to a certain extent. Like, I think what everyone said, because I know people always bring up, well, this is more audio that gets leaked from a meeting with boosters or, a, you know, a, one of those local club of Alabama yeah. meetings or something like that where people are like, oh, well, they usually don't know they're being recorded. It was very upfront. And now most places, you know, you're being recorded. Yeah, I mean, Jim Dunaway was the moderator. He's a radio host in Birmingham. (laughs) Like Like everyone knew that this was going to go out. And so I think Nick was very pointed in how he chose to go about addressing that. I think in bringing up those schools and bringing up accusations that had been a part of the public and the media discourse, he knew what he was doing. But you're right. He underestimated the response. My thought on the back end is, though, what is it actually going to do to negatively affect Nick Saban other than to now have everybody know what we already kind of figured we knew was that Jimbo doesn't really like him very much. Like, I don't yeah. think it helps Texas A&M anymore on October 8th now that you've po- you know, poked the bear. I-, yeah. I don't know what the line's going to be that game, but I don't know if you can give Texas A&M enough points for me to pick them. Yeah, w- Will Anderson is not going to stop being Will Anderson mm-hmm. because <laughs> Texas because Jimbo Fisher – slap back at at Nick Saban yeah it it is going to be it's going to be great just to see them now dance around this because they've got the SEC spring meetings in Destin coming up they have to be in a room together for two days that'll be fun it's not SEC media I know people it it sounds like the same things SEC spring meetings where they talk about rules it's funny because they're going to argue about scheduling which already was going to be a contentious topic and now you've got this on top of it it's it's God, I love I love all this stuff in May. And and we haven't even gotten what could be the best part of all this, which is when eventually Lane Kiffin can't help himself. Oh, yeah. Like there's going to be that breaking point cuz Lane was he was out and he was still involved to some extent, but we've seen him do far more poking of the bear and we know that relationship between him and Saban not the greatest thing in the world. I can't imagine most of the other coaches in the SEC have some sort of, you know, yeah. Everyone feels a little bristled and needled by Lane Kiffin, and he feels like the perfect chaos agent for this situation as we get to some of these closed-door meetings. Well, let's not forget who else will be in this room who does not care what anyone else in the room thinks, and that's Mike Leach. Mm-hmm. Like, who knows what he's going to say? I mean, he, he's, he just made lob one in, and, and it's funny because most other coaches love Mike Leach, including Lane Kiffin. So I, I'm fascinated by that. I I am also fascinated, and I was just thinking about this because it reminds me, my first varsity practice on high school uh, for high school football, I had gone through the freshman like JV practice we had, you know, we're a small central Connecticut school. Yeah. But so Dan, Dan Murphy, the superstar yeah. on the team from ESPN. Yeah. Shout out to shout out to my senior captain, Dan Murphy, who I've just followed every step of the way from Northwest Catholic to Notre Dame and now to ESPN and sports media and beyond. But um yeah, I, my first varsity practice, I had just finished with the freshman and JV team, and we had different study halls because of that. We were out practicing, so varsity would be in study hall. They had gotten in trouble that day for messing around in study hall. So I got over to varsity practice after a full freshman practice and had to immediately jump in with that group who was getting punished and had to do 128 up-downs as punishment. I had not done anything, but I was there, and so I was doing these up-downs. That is probably how Brian Kelly's got to feel walking into this fray and his first venture and his first season as LSU's head coach. What the hell did I just come into in this room? You already knew the SEC was probably going to mean a little bit more in the way they dealt with these meetings, and now it just got ratcheted up to 11. Welcome to the family, Brian Kelly. (laughs) So that is a great pivot point because you played for Brian Kelly at Notre Dame. How, uh, because it's odd for me to see him in the purple and gold and see him, you know, standing in front of the LSU team meeting room. How odd is that for you? Uh, It's definitely strange at this point. 
I think there were a lot of Notre Dame people, if they were honest with themselves, understood that Brian was probably going to leave eventually. There were plenty of, you know, other rumors that had popped up over the course of a decade plus that you thought might end up coming to fruition. But it's still definitely weird to see now. I mean, in my lifetime, he was the longest tenured head coach that I got to see and certainly the most successful you know, by far, I know Charlie Weiss in his early years at Notre Dame had some BCS runs, had those good teams with Brady Quinn and company. But for this to finish off, especially with five double digit win seasons, to be the all time wins leader in Notre Dame history above Newt Rockney, all those it's things crazy. that mean something at that place. So, yeah, even just looking on his Twitter the first day after and seeing the header and the profile with those different colors in it. And now for me, seeing. Jake Flint, who was the assistant strength and conditioning coach at Notre Dame when Brian Kelly came in under me, who I know really well. Mike Denbrock, who was our tight ends coach. All these coaches that I knew so well that were all so associated that in a lot of ways were Notre Dame men. Now down in Baton Rouge is pretty wild. Yeah, it, it is like the, uh, all the Florida guys I know. It was the same thing seeing Steve Spurrier and company at South mm -hmm. Carolina. Like, wait, wait, no, no, no. It's yeah. But it, it, was, it was weird for me because I grew up a South Carolina fan. So Ooh. I was like, oh, Coach is finally going to make him good. <laughs> so, and he did. Yeah. But, but it was but it's shocking. Like the first time you see them in the, in the colors, like it just, it doesn't, it doesn't register right. And, uh, but I thought it, it's interesting because, you know, I think if you'd have gone to somebody at Notre Dame a year ago and said, Brian Kelly's going to leave in, in December or November. What are you going to do? It all, the, the, it would have been like, oh, Luke Fickle, Matt Campbell. How, how quickly did Marcus Freeman establish, hey, I can be the next head coach here? So I remember I got to cover a Cincinnati. Uh, Cincinnati played USF at Cincinnati, I want to say in 2017 or 2018. And mm -hmm. I got to cover that game. And Mike Dembrock, who I just mentioned, who I knew really well, was the offensive coordinator. And Marcus was the defensive coordinator at the time. And I distinctly remember leaving that meeting with our crew after talking to Marcus and all of us kind of doing the thing. Because everyone who calls games, you all kind of have this sense. Liam Cohen, who is at Kentucky's now with right. the Rams, was another guy where you walk out of the room and you go, oh, that guy's going to be a head coach someday. Like just has all of that, you know, the understanding of where he fits in, the demeanor, all of it that lends you to believe this guy is going to make a head coach at some point. And so I think we've seen that for a while with him, but you just looked at the situation he walked into because Clark Lee was a guy that Notre Dame on defense really liked. Now the head yeah. coach of Vanderbilt, you heard a lot about what a great teacher he was, the relationship he had with guys on defense. And by the end of the season, everyone goes back to that video when Marcus first gets the job announced. But I'm always struck by the fact that he was able to earn that trust so quickly yeah, and to go in there and establish those relationships so quickly. It, it feels painfully obvious now watching him work as a head coach because the guy never stops. He is always communicating, whether it is with recruits, whether it is with alumni, whether it is with you know bringing former players back in. He's got a real great grasp on the relationship part of this. And so I think that just meeting and being around him Early on when he was at Cincinnati, when he first got to Notre Dame, you saw how much it genuinely mattered to him and how important he knew the relationships involved in this were. Yeah, that linebacker room at Ohio State back in the day must have been Ooh. something. <laughs> something, man. Like, but like again, like a testament to the relationships. Like James Laronitis is on staff now for Notre yeah. Dame in a role helping out there. Like that's how much he believed in Marcus and what he's doing here. And so I, I think to, like to your point like that, those little things are always indicative to me, how other people view you, talk about you and respond to you. Yeah. And, and it's amazing. It is. It's crazy that one position at one school over such a short period of time could produce coaches like that, that, that inspire Cause people who work with Vrabel feel the same way. Yep. People who work with fickle feel the same way. And in, and in Freeman, it's been very quick and very obvious that there's a lot of loyalty there. So, yeah, I can't I can't wait to see what he does. I, I'm very excited. I do uh, want to plug something that, that you're doing before I let you go. Uh, you got a, you have a uh, collaboration. Did you ever think you'd have a collab? As I did. 
I, I did not think, and you know what? Maybe it's appropriate that in the world of name, image, and likeness, where we have seen the big boys prosper in the ways that they have, that this would be possible. But no, this was uh, this was really cool. You are wearing the collaboration. Yes, currently. I am wearing the the thick six because you you coined this term. We we call them fat guy touchdowns, whatever you want to call them. Thick six is the way to is the way to, to, to describe it. The, the best way it's sort of like when they, when they did, came up with walk off home run, yes. you're like, Oh, that's what we should have always been calling it. Yeah. How, how did we ever live like this before? So yeah, coined the term thick six a couple of years ago, got to watch the course of college football season. It on signs at college game day, showing up and being talked about in broadcast. I even remember field Yates, the ESPN NFL insider yep. sent me one of like the internal league memos where they send out like, updates about the week, things that had happened, and Thick Six was included under NFL letterhead. So nice. once I saw we were inside the machine there, I was like, this is pretty cool. Why don't we be able to do something good with it? And I, I reached out to the folks at Home Field Apparel, Connor and company there who do the finest in you know collegiate apparel and, and the job that they've done as a great ambassador for the sport and one who has a really good soul in what they do. I reached out to them and said, hey, would you guys have any interest in partnering me? I want to make a shirt for this. I want to have something that people can use to rally around what's been a fun thing, but also see if we can do some good for it. And so we have the shirts. Uh, they pre-ordered and got sent out, uh, as Andy is is bearing a testament to right now. And all the proceeds have gone towards Feeding America because it, it felt like a cause very connected two big people. I always do yep. a lot of food jokes. I'm my father's son and, and, you know, talking and doing a lot of food content. But the very serious part of this is food insecurity is far too big a part of what goes on in this country, especially after what we've been through in the last few years, what we're going through right now, we see more and more of that. And so for this to turn into something where it was this celebration of big people and a chance to help other people put food on their plate was awesome. I cannot thank Connor and home field apparel enough. I cannot thank you and everyone else who bought these shirts and supported this cause enough because it was really cool to see the way it took off and how willing people were to give. Well, and feeding America is a great cause. Uh, the listeners know we, Ari and I did the 24 hour fast show where they pledged money and we, we raised some money for feeding America. And, and it's, it, it's one of those things where, I mean, nobody should have to go hungry. Yep. And they do such an amazing job of getting that money into communities and getting it to people who can, who can actually help. So, uh, yeah, if you, if you want homefieldapparel.com, you've, uh, you've heard of them. They, they were an advertiser on this show at one point. So uh, they're, they're great people. Uh, you may want to – you probably will find yourself ordering a couple other shirts. Uh, I've got – I've got Blaster the Burrow for Colorado School of Mines, and I got a great surfing, uh, surfing aardvark from UC Irvine. I, I also have the uh, Burrow for Colorado School of Mines. I have the fur-clad rock for Slippery Rock. Oh, that's a good one. I have, uh, I, I have a Pitt Panthers sweatshirt. Like It was just all comfy, and before they put the Notre Dame series out there, I, like everyone else who is a fan of home field apparel, have a bunch of clothing from colleges I didn't go to. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> well, that's what I – so my, I, my general rule is don't wear anything – of the teams I have to cover. So I yep. usually get the, the ones that don't have a football team. So I've got a, I got a Vermont Catamounts also, but when the Florida one came out, obviously my wife has two degrees from Florida. My kids are Florida fans. They, they, we hooked them up because they, they needed that. So yeah, it was, a uh, it, it, it's very interesting. I'm big on the old logos. Like the, the story of the, there's like one guy, I don't know if you talked to the home field guys about this, but, but I, I have, there was like one guy that that schools would go to in the 50s or 60s. And it's sort of like, you know, the uh, you go to the to the carnival and they've got yeah. the person who draws the caricatures like you like skateboarding. You like roller skating, right? <laughs> so his deal is I'm putting the mascot in a jaunty sailor's cap. It does not matter what animal the mascot is. It could be a tiger, a bulldog, an albatross. Don't care. Johnny sailor's cap. 
<laughs> it's first off was were those carnival characters the original pimp my ride like oh you have this one thing that you like let me make it an outsized part of this picture and make sure everyone good and damn well knows it but no you you're absolutely a fish right tank it's in my car yeah. <laughs> we're gonna put a dj booth in the driver's seat no steering wheel just turntables it's like dear god exhibit please i'm going to die <laughs> but uh, oh man no it really is remarkable i remember when i the first time i covered a get football game at kansas they had all of their old logos on the wall in the meeting room where we met with the coaches and i can't remember but it feels like spiritually one of them had a sailor's hat on and if it didn't probably i'm gonna photoshop it in I my mean, brain dude, to say it dude, was that way the dude put a, a hat on the oregon state beaver he put a hat on the auburn tiger like it didn't matter it's <laughs> Damn, I'm, I feel left out now because I haven't seen a leprechaun with one of those hats yet. Like, the leprechaun's certainly oh, known for his own it. style of hat, but we have to get him in one of those. It's the only way. It's destiny now. I think so. And you get the retro look, and oh, yeah. it's we got it. We got another collab. There you go. There we go. Leprechaun sailors, baby. It's happening. Twenty twenty three. Mike Golick Jr. is coming up with the revenue streams as we speak because that's right. The man is on his own now. The Gojo Podcast. You get it every day where you hear podcasts and I I'm already a regular listener subscribed downloading every day to my phone. So when you're done subscribing to the Andy Staples show, leaving a five-star review and asking a question that we will answer on the show. Cause we stole that concept directly from Michael jr. And then, then subscribe to his show and leave a five-star review and ask a question that he will answer on his show. Cause it was his idea. There we go. See, we are sharing ideas here. This is collaboration. This is what the space is supposed to be about. Rate our podcast, love our podcast publicly, and help us game the algorithm. Exactly. Also, I'm just stealing your idea, it's, but, it, but it's a fa fabulous idea. So, Hell yeah. Mike, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Andy. Appreciate it.